All right, we have Corey O'Neill here, a uh, senior product manager in the Bay Area. Also, my brother. Yeah, like Taylor said, brother, product manager. Uh, I've been working over a decade in product management, mostly on commerce and shopping experiences, and happy to be here today. Yeah, definitely. I don't know how we ended up in the same role, but uh, it took a while. You actually beat me to it by a couple of years, so we're excited to get your insights off you these things. So last week we talked about how we structure the work to be done. So things like epics and features and user stories and how you would write a good user story and things like that. This week, we're gonna talk about how we structure our teams and also the different rituals, they call them, of Agile, which is basically, if you're new to this, the meetings, but it's more to that. There's the kind of a tradition and encapsulation of different parts of the processes that were really crafted intentionally to help us get more work done that is valuable to the customer to have high performing teams and everything like that kind of making the transition from that to this that work around the work to do structured in the sort of strategy to product area where you're then talking about features epics and user stories that's like our list of the problems to be solved for the customer on that uh, side of a roadmap, but then it gets down to actual lists of things that we can develop that are like possible solutions to solve for that higher level of strategy. The roadmaps, you know, loosely kind of stable overall, but then those solutions and what works best to solve for that might be changing as we talk about things today and, and refining what we will do next in each subsequent sprint. So the five scrum ceremonies that we'll talk about, uh, Let's start with sprint planning. So at the start of a sprint, and there's also sprint pre-planning. Uh, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about the sprint planning process. With sprint pre-planning, as a product manager, a lot of that work is really just getting to the point where you're ready to talk about all of the work that needs to be done. Um, as a product manager, that's a lot. Uh, that's, you know, a third of your job right there is preparing to actually all of the strategy, all of the roadmap planning and everything that leads up to the actual execution side of things with your designers, your engineers. Um, planning itself is a meeting where it's an opportunity for you to get together with those teammates and talk through the work that you're preparing to bring to them. And in those meetings, you're really bringing to light um, things that may be problems um, or things that you need to refine better before you bring it to them. So you may have worked through a user story, you may have some mock-ups or designs that you're working through and you wanna get input in a formalized setting, maybe not just as like a one-off or a quick meeting that you're going through a drive-by. Planning is one of those opportunities to just go through those individual pieces of work and make sure that they are like to the T ready to go and it helps start some of the estimation process when you're starting to understand how much work that you're bringing to um, this is probably the second or third time that you're estimating some of the work but you're st you're slowly refining that lower and lower and until you get a more and more accurate hopefully accurate estimation of the work and planning is just another step in the pro that process is that how you go through the like level one, level two, and level three estimates as you get closer? I mean, level one, level two, level three sounds a lot formal than it often is in a company. Some places will have a very strict where you have to have that type of distinction of estimates. It's only very large organizations that are super strict around having that level of detail. Yeah, it, it totally depends. For a lot of the places I've worked, you essentially at roadmap stage create a high level plan so that you with high level estimations that just are like with your engineering vps and your engineering executives and maybe some uh engineering leads to get like a, a general guidance of how much a project or a theme of projects would would take and really it's at the estimation side where you're like getting down to individual projects and saying is this more of a four week project or a two week project? Is this more of a 13 week project or uh, a one week project? And 
there are still at that point there are so many unknowns in the equation and one of the things that scrum is supposed to be doing is we all know estimations are a difficult process humans don't know everything and um, so we're trying to learn in this process of uh, the work and what needs to be done and figuring out an estimation that of what we know at that point and what we know we don't know at that point to get an idea of what the work might be. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, estimation, like if you're in a college class that they assign the, what was a mythical man month book that I don't think anyone's ever read. I don't know. You know, the challenges of estimating work has been, you know, always a thing from, you know, a hundred years ago till now. But like yeah. the, there's also, I mean, what do you think about just the, you're, you guys are in college, when you think about sitting down to write any kind of paper, uh, if somebody at the beginning of that assignment asked you how exactly how many hours it takes to write this paper, you'd be like, ah, I think this paper is going to take me an hour to write. And you sit down and you write for an hour and then you realize you're like, ah, I only made it halfway through. I'm nowhere near done. I mean, that's what you're trying to do in a work environment on much more complex problems every single day. And an engineer may not have worked in that area of the application ever before. And, or there just may be a whole bunch of bugs that we didn't know about, or, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. So it's a challenge every day to get to that information. Scrum and Agile are trying to provide tools in which we can both better communicate with each other um, around setting the right expectation, but also provide tools within the system itself to bring out the knowledge that we need to throughout the process to get better requirements, better estimations, get just get better as we go. We covered a couple of things there as well on the team. So we didn't really mention the team. We mentioned we are product managers, so that's one role on the team. Uh, you'll also hear interchangeable in some ways and not others, like the term Scrum Master. Uh, and then you also mentioned developers, of which there are a couple kinds, and then designers. So there also could be others. So what about roles on the team? What do you typically see? My teams, they're, they vary. Right now I'm on quite a large team that has product managers and developers. But like I also have been on many projects where it's just me and a uh, you know senior designer and a junior designer. And we're doing mostly user experience, user interface work. Uh, so some of these processes are more truncated and a little bit more simple when we have work that's only focused on that portion of it where a developer at a client or something might be taking that work from us later so it simplifies it but for you what have you experienced for the most part i mean this has for sure changed over the years of what uh companies believe is the right ratio of product manager to engineer to designer to there's other kind of roles whether it's um taylor mentioned developers different types of developers where you're talking front end back end and then there's also like support different types of support engineers in my experience most of the stuff i'm working on these days is consumer facing meaning the person who's using the software is an end consumer you like um versus like a business user who might be using the software within the company um more likewise what that means that there's there's a lot more UI and interaction that you need to think about um, and develop as part of that. And so for that, usually we end up having per team at least half of a designer, which is just half of their time and they could be assigned to multiple teams. Hopefully it's it's one full designer full time on the team. And then you have at least four um, engineers, a QA engineer, hopefully full time. Uh, QA is dedicated to testing the software as you're building it and making sure that you're finding the, all the bugs um, as you go. Depending on the company, there's other roles that are support roles as well. Um, like last company, we had an engineering manager and a part-time project manager as well. So you'll see a bunch of different variations of this depending on leadership's opinions around how the teams are best and most productive and there's what's what's good right now is that there's a lot of resources online that you can find around these kind of ratios to kind of understand why there might be one setup versus another and approximately what the ratios are yeah absolutely so and to make it really concrete and practical since we talk about these things all conceptually 
Like we're in, you know, a ticketing system like Jira is the most common for large organizations. You know, we're looking at that ticket. We talked about like having the work done ahead of time. So when it gets to a developer, it is ready to work. They're not just sitting there with like a lot of questions to be asked. Like if there are questions, they might tag you in the Jira comments and like push it to maybe a different status. But there's these statuses, status I, <laughs> the ticket, I just have to go through it. Status of you go through the ticket of like, uh, the backlog like we're talking about and then it depends on what methodology you're using like in a kanban there's like you know to do is kind of the part after backlog and then doing and then um like some sort of in process and you want to limit the things you're working on so you can have that focus and actually increase your through through but just like anything in life having like 50 different you know books you're writing probably not a great idea you should probably focus on one book you're writing and then like we mentioned QA, so you can put it in a in review status where QA is reviewing it uh, and they, they can kick it back to development if there's, you know, needs to be uh, something there to get approved. And that's where last week we talked about acceptance criteria. They're testing it based on acceptance criteria and some other detail on the testing side uh, to see if it actually passes uh, each of those tasks to be done. At the end of the day, we have all these processes and steps that we've created to develop this product. We're trying to develop software that is valuable for the customer and is high quality. High quality meaning it's uh, the code is up to a particular standard so that we're not just releasing something out that needs to be fixed immediately and is not valuable to the customer. And so the steps you're talking about, the statuses that you're going through are all just those kind of mini checks in the process to make sure that we're being able to communicate with each other during that process to make sure things aren't dropped and things that are getting to the right people. So there's a status for uh, QA or sending uh, sending something to QA so that they know when they get a ticket, that ticket gets sent to them, they know, okay, this needs to be worked on now. Um, and then there will be a status to send it back to the engineering team so that they can go back and rework and take a look at what they found um, in the process. So all of these things are really just ways to communicate um, during the process. Speaking of ways to communicate and having that connection to the team, your primary ritual for Agile and Scrum is the daily Scrum. So that check-in usually in the morning. If you have developers, maybe it's 10 a.m. on the West Coast, uh, but uh, that's that three questions you ask every day. Uh, you know, what did you do yesterday? Uh, what are you working on today? And then do you have any blockers? And the blockers is, you know, the big one, or, you know, do they have questions that need to be answered? Is there something else? You know, is there a license they need? Is there an API that's not worried? Like, is there something else they need to bubble up uh, and escalate so they can get help to do that? Or do they need help from someone else or something like that? Um, but we can do that practically in a few ways. You could do that on a, a Zoom or whatever. Uh, you can also do it with like a Slack bot. You can set up a workflow or a Slack plugin. I like Poly. There's a few new ones coming out with some AI automated uh, connections even to Jira, which is pretty amazing. Um, but what do you do for the daily scrum? How do you like to run it? Slack bots are fine. It really depends on the culture of the teams that you're working with. Um, you know, in a remote world, like I, I felt like when we were going to the office, the Slack bots were because everybody was seeing each other face to face and still having good opportunities to connect. If you're fully remote and you still have those opportunities to connect with your engineers and make sure there's active communication, then great. But sometimes the Slack bots are, by the Slack bots meaning like a Slack bot sends out a message and asks those three questions that Taylor's talking about. The engineer, individual engi engineer responds to them and it just goes out to a, a group Slack channel and everybody can look at it and see it. Um, but they kind of do it on their own time. It's asynchronous and usually it's like, hey, have this in by 10 a.m. Um, and it's up to everybody to do that. Um, yeah, so it, there's pros and cons of both. But for me, um, I've done both. Uh, it depends on which team and the culture that you have of what works better. Um, ultimately with, with the daily scrum, what's important is that yes, you're getting an update of what you did yesterday, 
um, as most likely an, an engineer, but I've had designers join these and do the same thing. And product people don't normally do this, but sometimes um, just so that we're communicating out to the engineers just broadly what um, what may be coming down the future, because that's what we're doing with a part of our time anyways, uh, so that they have that in the back of their mind. You're doing your daily update. Um, you're talking about what you're going to do today. Um, and then you're talking about your blockers because uh, that meeting is a way, another way to just collaborate. And you're not supposed to really be talking problem solving in that meeting. You're supposed to be talking about just giving the update so that people broadly are aware. And if there are things that do need to happen because you have blockers or you're working on something that has dependencies with something that someone else is working on, that gives you a, a chance to say, oh, okay, uh, Taylor's working on this already. That means the thing that I'm gonna be working on, I need to be able to start that in a day or two because he's gonna be done with that. That's just one example why the communication is important but they're supposed to be very very quick meetings like between five and 15 minutes depending on the size of your team and no one's supposed to be uh really chatting with each other that point problem solving you give your update and then the at most you say hey that needs to be talked about more okay let's uh after this meeting let's meet up and and discuss that finer point yeah that's how we do it uh we parking lot it or whatever um sometimes we also have a standing blockers meeting that's like a optional and they can only attend if they're they have a blocker and can shout it out but yeah that's how i like to do it a, a lot of these ceremonies are put in place so in a way you don't have to think about having to communicate everything that you're doing with people with your teammates you're really trying to put in a process where you just step into the box and you're like okay here's your, your your opportunity to talk today about this and you're like oh you know what i do have blockers and you may not even think about it before you get into that meeting because let's be honest the lesson of life is that we're all poor poor communicators right we're all trying to get better whether in your relationships work and school about communicating more effectively and scrum is trying to put in these ceremonies Yes, they're meetings, but they're really just, again, ways to communicate with people and make it more natural and more effective in, in your day-to-day -day life. And you don't even have to think about it anymore. And it helps us get each individually get better at doing that. That's a really good reminder. I mean, if you go agile manifesto style, it's good to kind of call up the principle uh, people over processes. So these processes are good because they are valuable and connected to doing that and helping us become better communicators. If we're just putting in a bunch of meetings and doing that just for like the sake of following a bunch of rules and it's not connected to that, that is kind of a trigger in our mind to be like, let's make sure these are adding value and what their purpose was yeah. to do. Sprint review is or a sprint demo. Um, okay. It, again, it is like very different company to company. It can be very not valuable, it can be very valuable. Some places, a lot of places I've been have just kind of defaulted to the sprint review is an internal review where or you're showing off what you did in that sprint, what was what you were able to uh, finish within that sprint to your internal stakeholders, meaning the product manager, often the designer, um, who may not be there day to day or day to day communicating with your engineers. Hopefully they're doing at least some, but if they're not, at least they come to the sprint review, just be able to see down to like pixel perfect level, what was completed and making sure it's good to go before it gets anywhere near pr production. That's one process, but there's also like, uh, when I first started sprint reviews were touted as something that you bring all of your stakeholders, not just within the team, but like your VP of products, business stakeholders to the meeting. It was supposed to be half like, hey, look what we completed. Uh, we're getting ready to release it. We want to get you excited about it. And, uh, we want to get our business stakeholders excited about what we're building and that we're providing value and that we're building the right thing for the customer and the business. 
and everybody gets to see it at that point. The thing is when you scale that up and you have, you know, 10 teams, 20 plus teams as a tech organization, having all those different stakeholders join and to review a product, which uh, and practicality in this sprint process, you're getting towards the end of your sprint and there may be like final things that you're working on still. It's really hard to find the right time to be able to have that word demo and it be a hundred percent done and not have like a, a VP join and be like, what's this little thing that doesn't quite work in the sprint review? And you're like, well, there's it's, we know about that. Uh, we still have five days before the sprint's over and we always do the demo here. It's going to be fixed by that. We're sorry, but they like, that can be tough from a stakeholder management perspective that when you're like looking at a bug and you know, it's going to be fixed because you, when you're presenting often, you want it be to be as perfect as possible, depending on the business stakeholder that you're working with, because they might not understand all the things that you're going through on a day-to-day -day basis within a spread to actually launch something where you're tweaking and refining and you're getting it across the finish line. Spur reviews, like a, it's a ceremony that you'll see very different from company to company. And you'll have to figure out just how it works within uh, the business that you're at and what works best for, for it to provide value. And maybe that's why it's kind of ended up being just an internal thing for a lot of companies because it's such a difficult one to provide value with a bunch of different people. Yeah, everyone's been through some kind of a presentation or a small admire thing. And so yeah. derailing it when you, you know, put your blood, sweat, and tears into something. And a typo is the thing that is the most yeah. discussed for for an hour. Um, so the other one is the Sprint Retro. And so I'll kind of share, I really love doing that since I'm a big fan of like self-improvement, team improvement, growth, and learning. And that scrum and agile do this is really actually awesome because it has that self-awareness individually and as a team on you know what things went well uh what things didn't um and other things in the future that might be in the way so a lot of people have a different uh templates to do that i actually have a favorite one i'll link in the description below for miro and uh, you can do this on post-it notes on a whiteboard or uh there's some live whiteboard software we use when we do remote uh, where you can even anonymously have everyone put post-its up and then you group them into themes uh, for this. So I'll share mine on the, the groups because I actually think when you're managing a team, a lot of these types of meetings, and we want good constructive feedback, but they can go negative and spiral and turn into more of a venting session, which some venting is good, you know, because that energy needs to go out somewhere. And also you don't want it to turn in sort of a complaint fest that spirals and doesn't, you know, help us grow as a team. So there's one I like that's, it's a little bit cheesy, but I think you'll like it too, because we like the ocean, uh, that is like sailboat retrospective. And so it's on Miro, on the Miroverse, you can download it. It actually has the categories, uh, they're a little cheesy, but bear with me. There's wind, so there's like what helped us forward. There's uh, sun, what made us feel good. So like if you complimented your teammate or like they did something for you or whatever, oh, just, you know, great, because you're, these are jobs and lives and stuff like that's awesome. Uh, they have anchor, so things that like held us back a little bit. Maybe that's resourcing, maybe something was just really hard. Um, then there's also a uh, reef. So like in the coral reef, for us they're fun because we're scuba diving, I love coral reefs. If you're like a boat, they're less fun because the keel on the sailboat might scrape across a coral reef. Very bad for the environment, also bad for your project. So those are like the risks ahead you're trying to avoid, trying to avoid that coral reef, go down a deeper channel. I don't know, what, how do you like to do retrospectives? What's your perspective on them? Um, yeah, I, I agree, Rob. Like, I love retrospectives on positive teams. They can be, um, going back to what I said earlier, we're trying to find ways to better communicate effectively and collaborate with, with the teams. And retrospectives are really nice places for us to um, take a pause uh, with your fellow teammates who are, everybody's a human, everybody is going through things individually on the project, outside of their lives, things are going on. It's one of those human moments where you look around and the ultimately the end goal is in a very kind of egoless way to look around and say, how can we as a team be more effective? And how as, as an individual can I be more effective? 
and be able to take constructive criticism from each other. Hopefully it's not a lot of like one-on-one directing. You don't want to be pointing fingers by any means. You're just looking around and saying, hey, looking back at this spread, here's what we planned to accomplish. Here's what we accomplished. Um, did we miss things? Did we make mistakes? Do we have the right tools? Like a lot of it isn't even personal. It's just like, hey, uh, it's engineers or designers. Sometimes designers join these. Sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes product managers join these. Sometimes they don't. I think it's better that they do. Um, and you're looking around. And you're like, hey, well, you know what? Um, there's a whiteboard tool, <laughs> Miro, that I think would really help with this part of the process for brainstorming. Like, here's a suggestion for that. And that's a great space to be able to do that. For me, format-wise, on retrospectives i really like there's a few little tricks that i like doing just you know engineers uh all stereotype for a second introverts they like to sit on the computer do a problem i like doing this sit on a computer problem solve for a while do it for hours and not have a ton of social interaction all the time maybe social interaction through a computer but uh not in a big room with a whole bunch of people that's a over generalization for sure but that, that often means that it's hard in a room to talk about how can we get better, talk about ourselves, talk about each other in a retrospective. So one of the good best ways to do, to set up a conversation like that is that I found is in a retrospective, the beginning of a retrospective, you start with, you know, a digital whiteboard or Google Docs with those three questions um, laid out and spend the first you know, 15 minutes of a 45 minute or an hour long meeting and just either in silence or my favorite thing is to put music on and tell everybody, okay, you have 15 minutes to write your answers to these questions. Here's some fun music. Go ahead and go. And everybody individually hops onto the dock and starts adding in their thoughts. It's also kind of fun as people are doing that and saying what went well, what didn't go well. They're adding in their compliments to each other. They're saying, you know what, this, I think there's a better opportunity for this. That helps that as people are seeing that, that helps trigger th additional thoughts for them. And then they add, so it's, it's a sort of silent communication that's going on that really builds very quickly that I really like. Um, and then once you finish, once that 15 minutes finishes, everybody um, then takes a moment and we read through that one by one and give an opportunity to that person who wrote that comment, an opportunity to say like, oh, here's what I meant by that. Um, you especially want to do that for like the things that the times that people are like giving props and recognition to teammates so that um, you're giving space for that, but as you go through each of those and call things out, that again creates another opportunity for people to be like, oh, you know what, that's a great idea, let's add this. And then as you're going through all of them, um, you probably do this as well, where uh, you end up with action items to follow up on. So as you're going through each of that, you're like, oh, well, yeah, let's Miro, or in, maybe there's a new QA tool we want to try out to solve this problem. Um, okay, uh, let's create an action for item for that and assign it to somebody to do the next step. You don't have to create a full plan for it, but like take that to the next step. Also, um, it's important to, in our retrospective to follow up on the, uh, talk about the things that were in the next step. And sometimes the things that you talked about last time, maybe review a few of those to be like, oh, did we, we, two weeks ago, we talked about this. Did anything happen from that? Did we get better at that? Did we not? Did we get worse at that? Or do we need to re revisit it? Um, so it's, it's yeah, like Taylor said, it's, it's all self-development from both an individual perspective and the team perspective. I think you can get into some of these environments where this communication isn't happening and you can sit there and stew for a long time and have a whole bunch of complaints and not have an outlet for it, not even within your own team. And if you don't have something like a retrospective, somebody could be sitting there for months and years and be like, if only we put in this tool, or if we only did change this process, things would be a little bit better. And 
they don't really want to, uh, and I don't blame them, like, go to an executive or some big leader and be like, we have to change this and here's a process and we should be doing this because, you know, they're just, everybody's just trying to get through the day and, and get what they need to do done at the end of the day, do a good job. But it's, it's difficult to take the next step and make things better and, and take a large step and make things a lot better. And the retrospective is just like a small step that like helps you create little bits of opportunity that maybe like, Hey, well, there was a problem with this. Well, maybe other people are having a problem with this too. And like, uh, maybe a product or an engineering manager can take that feedback if, if it's appropriate, um, and, it, uh, to take that out of the row to uh, a bigger audience to get things better across the company too. Yeah, I even know some people that do monthly relationship uh, retrospectives. So, uh, pretty, yeah. It's a pretty cool <laughs> practice. If you even uh, get it wrong to agree to that, I think it's pretty fun. But uh, see, it looks like the the other uh, agile ritual is uh, happy hour. See that? It's, it's uh, the sprints tiki happy hour. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's a good time to wrap this up because I think we need to go to the, the sprints happy hour after that. So, uh, yeah, sounds good. But, yeah. All right, thanks, Corey. We'll we'll see you next time. Appreciate your thoughts. Absolutely. Do see.